working. Everybody open your Bibles, please, uh, to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I've always made kind of the other key passages, uh, first, uh, is first Peter chapter 3. And in that passage, uh, there is uh, six verses for the women and their role, one verse for the men and their role. And men like it kind of uh, down and, and simplistic. But in Ephesians chapter 5, actually it's the reverse. The women get verses 20 through 22 through 24, three verses. And the men get verse 25 all the way through to verse 32. And so, um, yeah, this is really the most concentrated teaching on the role of... Now remember that... Uh, a lot of what's in bookstores everywhere is what I would call helpful advice for marriage. Helpful advice for marriage. Do these little practical things. The Bible doesn't uh, really get into that. Uh, the Bible uh, indicates that the number one thing for a successful marriage uh, is understanding your role. All right? That men and women are not the same. Men and women are equal under God in every way, but men and women are not the same. They're not interchangeable. And so what a woman does is unique to what a man does and that the way that they fit together, more than just physically, but emotionally and spiritually and in every way, uh, shows the creative genius of Almighty God. That a man is much more because of the woman that he's with functioning properly. And the woman is much more because of the man that she's with functioning properly. And so those roles become uh, very important. What is my place? What is my part? What is my role? Now last week we talked about the role of the woman, which is to submit or yield to uh, the leadership of her husband. There were many caveats and explanations of that that were given, but here were the five main points. Uh, a wife should yield to her husband's leadership because it is biblical, number one. Every New Testament passage that deals with a wife's relationship to her husband tells her to submit to him. Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 3, and Titus 2. Secondly, it is the way that God uses wives to change their husbands. Husbands need to change and their wives know it. Ladies, that was a great spot for an amen. But the way that they would tend to go about it in their flesh actually goes against the very thing that they're trying to accomplish. Proverbs says, every wise woman builds her house and the foolish tears it down with her own hands. What a warning. So yielding is the way that God uses wives to change their husbands. Incredible. And many here can testify to that. Uh, thirdly, it affirms and edifies your husband's uh, in his responsibility under God. Uh, fourthly, without this biblical yielding or submission, um, you get between God and your husband. You get in between. You're blocking what God's trying to do uh, with your words, with your uh, talking and, and pressing him and trying to raise up over his inadequacies. And that produces one of two things, a very dominant husband but more often what it produces is a very passive husband. More often the man's like, you want to lead? You want to be in charge? You want to call the shots? Do it. Do it. I got lots I can do. And men get passive and they back away from their responsibilities. Fifthly, with it, with that biblical yielding, you are allowing God to use your obedience as one of the instruments of change in your husband's life. All right, so that's a summary of last week. And now into Ephesians 5.25. Let's start with this main thought this morning. Uh, if you're uh, here and you're uh, not married, uh, this can be a good deposit for your future. If you're here and you uh, want to be married again uh, by God's grace somehow uh, in the future, this can be a good foundation for you. But the main focus uh, here is a husband. So uh, people unmarried, uh, uh, wives, uh, your job right now for the next 40 minutes or so is to pray. Uh, men, uh, husbands I have in mind. Let's see the hands of all the husbands here. Put your hands up. Hold them up high. Excellent, excellent. Hold them up. Don't be yanking them down until I get my head over there to look at you. <coughs> all right? Husbands, fantastic. Um, coming your way now. Start with this main thought. This message is for husbands. I'd like to make it real clear. This message is for husbands. A husband is a person who has a wife. 
Like, wow, you worked on that all week? I did. <laughs> um, if you stood at the front of a church or in front of a justice of the peace and you held a woman's hand and you made some promises to her and to God and to whoever was there to witness, you are a husband. And uh, historically, it comes from the root word, uh, meaning someone who manages and directs with care and wisdom. A husband is one who takes responsibility for his wife, okay? Now, um, Ephesians 5, 25, isn't it great that God's Word pulls this uh, exact subject to the forefront, and Ephesians 5, 25 begins, husbands, love your wives. Now, I'm just going to camp on this for a few minutes here. It's a simple phrase. If you like to memorize Scripture, memorize this one, Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives. All right? Now, if you have even average intelligence, men, you've already got that verse memorized. How's it going? Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives. Say it with me, men. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives. What does it mean? What does it mean? Let's take it a word at a time. Right now, we're working on husbands. To be a godly man is more difficult than it has ever been before. To be a godly husband, I want to acknowledge, is more difficult than it has ever been before. And I want the men here to understand that I understand the complexity and the demands of the job that God has entrusted to you. A married man is asked to wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> Number one, a husbands are wearing the provider hat. Bring home the bacon. Work hard, get ahead, save for college. Be successful, but be at home. Work hard enough to provide for the things that your family needs, but when you get home, don't come home like some guy who exhausted himself, even though you did. Save your best energies for the people at home. Everywhere you go, the demands on you are highest. You have to be at your best at work or you won't be at work. You have to be at best at home because everyone keeps telling you, including the preacher over the church, that that role is the most important role that you have as a husband and a father. And so you wear the provider hat. Secondly, you get home, you wear the handyman hat. Cut the grass, fix the plumbing, build this, change that. Do it cheap, but do it right. <laughs> How's that going? Thirdly, you have to wear the dad hat. Play with the kids, train the kids spiritually, spend time with them, go to their games. Here's the tension, be fun, but be firm. My wife was never slow with our kids to play the wait till your father gets home card. So, so I gotta connect with my kids and have a warm personal relationship with them, but I also gotta lower the hammer sometimes and bring it down. That's, dads, that's a tough job, right? So, have to wear the dad hat. And then fourthly, when you're done with the provider and the handyman and the dad hat, you haven't even got your most important home hat on yet. You gotta wear the husband hat. Except for the Christian hat, this is your most important role. Blow it with your wife and you've blown it, period. You can be successful everywhere else, but if you fail at this, you have failed. A lot of responsibility, and the Bible indicates that all of this is resting upon the person called husband. So we have our job clear. Let's go to the next word. Husbands, what's the next word, men? Oh. <coughs> that was weak. This section here was strong. Over here, y'all are weak, man, weak. I'll give you another run at that. Husbands, oh. love your wives. Love them. The Greek a verb there, the original language, is the word agapao. Now, this is not talking about eros, which is physical or sexual love. It's not talking about that. When it says, husbands, love your wives, it is not saying, husbands, make love to your wives. Okay, it's not what it's saying. Lest some of you go out of this message, get home today, say, honey, it's time that we were doers of the word and not hearers only. <laughs> All right? want to make sure that we're applying the Word of God at our house, okay? 
Now that's not wrong. We're going to have a message on sexuality and marriage in a few weeks. But that's not what this is saying. Okay? When it says husbands love your wives, it's not talking about eros, that physical sexual intimacy. A second, another word for love uh, is the word phileo, from which we get our uh, word Philadelphia, the brotherly love. And, and uh, men, your wife should be your best friend. Don't, don't let yourself use the words best friend if you don't have your wife's name in that sentence. Uh, friendship is an incredible metaphor for a lifetime relationship. All right? But that's not what this passage is talking about when it says husbands love your wives. It's not exhorting you to make love to your wife and it's not exhorting you to go out for coffee with your wife. Though those things are important. Men say they are important. They're important. They're important. That's not what this text is saying. When it says husbands love your wives, the word is agapao. It's the biblical term that describes God's love, a giving love a selfless love, a sacrificial love. Men, you should be able to just as quick as quick can be, you should be able to jot down a list of three or four or five things that you won't be doing this week that you may even want to do, but you won't be doing them because you're going to love your wife. You don't get to do everything you want to do. And we're all so selfish, aren't we? But when you committed yourself to loving another person, uh, here is the definition we like to use. I write these, uh, it's a little short form. U, the letter U, and then the letter B, and then the number four, and then the word me. That's it. It's the whole thing. Write it down just like that. Did you write it just like that? Did you? You, well done, well done. You, B, four, me. That is the essence of marriage. That's what you're called to as a man. You're called to put another person first. And every time that we put ourselves first, every time I put myself first, every time you put yourself first, you are taking an axe to the base of your own tree, yo. All right? You're chopping your own thing down. You're wrecking your own future when you get selfish. You're contradicting what God has called you to and what God gives you grace to accomplish. You say, James, you have any idea how big a job that is? Right. That's the job that's supposed to keep you on your knees and keep you growing in your faith because you can't do it yourself. And the Bible says husbands love your wives. That is the greatest calling that you have. No matter what choices your children make, no matter how you're ill-treated in the marketplace, no matter how you're betrayed by friends and other people, if you get this one thing done, you are a successful man. This is an awesome calling that we've been given. Husbands, love, love, selflessly love your wives. This kind of love is an act of the will. Some people say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of not feeling it anymore. This isn't a feeling move. This is an act of your will. First discipline, then desire, then delight. Jot this down. Do the things that love does, and you will feel the things that love feels. Men, start doing again the things that love does. Think back to how you wooed this girl and how you won this girl, all right? And how many of those things you don't do those anymore? Shame on you. Go back and do the things that love did and you will feel the things that love felt, okay? First actions, then the feelings that follow. Get busy about those things. How many times men tell me, I used to buy her flowers, I used to take her out on dates, I, I used to spend time just holding her hand and looking into her eyes and talking to her about our future and talking to her about the things about her that blessed me and the things that I loved and adored about her. Yeah, well, how long since you did that? Oh, I don't know, a long time, I don't remember. And I don't know what's wrong with her either. All right? Start doing the things that love did and you will feel the things that love felt. That's what it means when it says husbands love your wives. And just as a way of reminder, God holds you responsible for this. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell, we 
understand that the man was given responsibility for the wife. Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. In chapter 3, when Eve uh, took the fruit that was forbidden and ate it, interestingly, when God came to, to hold them accountable, he did not come to the woman. Genesis 3, 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? God knew where he was, but Adam didn't know where he was. He had shirked his responsibility. And even though the woman ate first, Adam was not there to take care of her and protect her. And he had failed in his responsibility. And God moved not first toward Eve, but toward Adam to hold him accountable for his family. How important this is. You're responsible for the temperature of the marriage in your home. You're responsible. God holds you responsible. Someday you're going to stand before Christ and account for your marriage. And you're not going to be able to say, my wife, my wife, my wife. You're responsible. I can't make it any clearer than that. I'll say it a last time. God holds you responsible for the temperature, the tone, the quality of your marriage. Men, husbands, point to who's responsible. I'm responsible, okay? Now, so that means if you guys have had a quarrel or a fight and you're doing the silent, you ever do the silent treatment? Anybody ever do the silent treatment? Honesty, men, put up your hands sometimes if you let that silent thing go on. You know, you heard about the couple that was doing that, right? And they had a fight and then one day they didn't talk and another day they didn't talk and another day they didn't talk. Went on for four or five days. Can you believe it? They never talked. Four or five days of silent treatment. Finally, he had to go out of town on a trip somewhere for business and not wanting to be the first to give in, he wrote a note to her and left it where she'd have to find it and said, I have to get up at 5 a.m. for my flight. Please wake me at 5 a.m. <laughs> left her a note. 5 a.m. passes, 9 a.m. He sits straight up in bed. The sun's shining in the room. He missed the flight. Very upset with her. He jumps out of bed. He's about to confront her, but he sees on the table where he left the note for her, she's left him a note. It's 5 a.m., wake up. <laughs> so hey, that kind of nonsense is going on at your house, men. You're, say, I'm responsible, say it. God holds you responsible. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Here's the next part. I bet you can guess it. We're done with husbands now. We're done with love. Guess what the next part is? I'm listening, man. What is it? Your. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. The man who has an eye for every pretty woman walking by, that guy's a fool, all right? That guy's destroying his own marriage, his own wife. The guy who has an eye for every pretty woman and attention for every a woman who seeks it, listen, listen, is depleting his capacity to love his own wife. Kindness, even occasional compliments to other women are not wrong, but they should never total more than a drop in the bucket compared to the attention and affection that you lavish upon your own wife. She's the only wife you will ever have. That's God's plan. She's the only wife you will ever have. She is the only woman you will ever sleep with. She is the only provision for all of your needs. Lavish your affection upon her. Husbands, love your wives. Your marriage is what you make it. You say, well, I... I I haven't made it very much. We'll make it something now then. Trace all the great future that God will unfold to you to this date and a change of heart and mind. I'm going to love my wife. Talk to her. Ask her forgiveness. Before the sun goes down today, get alone. 
sit at a table, take her hand and say, I have not done. Regardless of the things that you would want to tell her, regardless of the things that you know that she's done to make it difficult, take the first step as the leader of your home and say, I have failed you. I will do better. Please forgive me. I see a great future for us. If we return to the things that we used to do, we will return to the feelings that we used to have and let your humility be the thing that unloads God's grace upon your marriage and upon your future. Start afresh today to love her, your wife. Love her with a love that looks for needs to meet and finds a joy in seeking to meet those needs. Love her with a love that listens with full attention to the details that she wants to share had to apologize to Kathy. I've been busted three or four times just in the last couple of weeks for looking at my phone when Kathy was talking to me. <laughs> Put, I'm still alive, right? Yeah. Put it down. Put it away. Give her your full and undivided attention. I'm working on that. Love her with a love that listens with full attention to the details that she wants to share, not because you think you need to know them, but because you love the person who wants to say it. Love her with a love that opens up and shows her your real thoughts and feelings, your hurts and fears and disappointments. If you're in a tough place right now financially, just sit with your partner and say, I'm fearful about these things. Don't be strong for her in a foolish way and lock her out of your thoughts. She's your greatest asset. Bring her into the discussion and say, I'm burdened about this. We need to pray about this together. She doesn't need you to be strong in a way that locks her out. That's not real strength at all. Love her with a love that listens and opens back, opens up and comes back first to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Please forgive me. Who does that first in your relationship? Kathy, uh, my wife, grew up in a home that uh, didn't have uh, a good model of conflict resolution. My parents fight in front, fought in front of us, made up in front of us. We saw it all, and it was healthy. And so early on in our marriage relationship, I was always the first one. I can remember, maybe Kathy wants me to say this, that we've been married for 27 happy years. And we used to just say for 27 years, but now she wants me to say for 27, amen. Now she wants me to say for 27 happy years because we know so many people that have been married for a good number, but not happy. And we've always been blessed with a happy marriage, and though we've worked at it, and I can remember a time when I had to say to her, honey, it's always me. I always am the first person. But interestingly, that was at around the 10-year mark. At around the 20-year mark, she had to come back to me and say, why am I always the first person? Why do I always have to be the one to humble myself, to break the ice first when there's been difficulty? And that should be reciprocal. You ought to be able to look at your marriage and think of many times where both people have gone first. And if one person in your marriage is always the first to say they're sorry, always first to break the ice, always first to come back, you are crushing the spirit of that person. Men, if your wife always has to, and you kind of wait, and you know she'll come eventually, and you make her suffer till she does, that is great wickedness. It's great wickedness. You are crushing the spirit of the person that you claim to love and put first. You're just putting yourself first. Any pagan can do that. You're not different than those in the world. Christ hasn't changed you in that way, but he wants to. And so I'm speaking to you today. It needs to be at least reciprocal. And if you're in a deficit, you need to catch up and be the first. Even as you leave today, She'll be wondering what you thought about this. And you can take her hand and say, I've been convicted by the Lord. I know that I've been wrong in certain ways, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. We're going to get together today and talk and head toward a better place together. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. How important that is. How critical that is. 
God, help us to love our wives. So this message is for husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. And now, fourthly, can you guess what this part is? <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. This is, this is absolutely critical. And, uh, okay, men, this will help. Women are not the same as men. I know, I know you come to count on me for these breathtaking insights. <laughs> All right? Women are not the same as men. Women are different than men. Did you hear about the guy who was uh, reading a book and, and uh, it was about uh, men taking leadership of their home? And so uh, he came home and, and he was kind of on this now and he said, honey, things are going to be changing around here. I'm, I'm to be the leader of our home and I'm going to be taking charge. So let me just say, first of all, I need a great dinner tonight. And, and when that's done, I need an amazing dessert. Impress me. And when that's done, I want you to draw my bath, and I'm going to have a long bath. While I'm there, you can rub my shoulders and my back. When I'm done, I want you to bring me my slippers and my uh, robe, and, I'll, and when I get out, uh, guess who's going to be uh, combing my hair? She says, uh, the funeral director? <laughs> Love that. All right? You should know this. Nowhere in Scripture is a man told to take his position of authority in the home. That is something that is yielded to you by your equal. She yields that to you out of reverence for Christ. You don't ask for it. You don't demand it. You don't explain it. You win it through serving. That's what you do, all right? So men who take the biblical teaching on male leadership and use it as a way of uh, executing some position of, of superiority or, or demand in their home have completely failed in regard to what the Scripture says, all right? Clear? You don't ask for it. You don't demand it. You don't explain it. You serve and hope that it arrives out of reverence for Christ. Husbands, love your wives. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, men dwell with your wives in an understanding way. In an understanding way. The idea there is to uh, study your wife. Study your wife. And... Uh, I see a lot of people here that I know, and I know the story of you, and when you, I know the story of you, and how you fell in love, and when you got married. How long have you been married now? 15 years. You ought to have your PhD in your wife, man. You ought to be like the card-carrying president of the Understanding Her Society. Nobody should get her better than you do. Right? You should have studied her. I understand her timing. I understand her rhythms. I understand her patterns of thinking. I understand the things that frighten her. I understand the things that burden her. And I'm shaping my whole leadership of this family around dwelling with her in an understanding way. That's your biggest project in life. Okay? And that could be a complicated project. Women are different than men. Permit me some generalizations. Women are more sensitive than men. They're more sensitive. Women are wounded by things that men don't even notice. You what? You what? We're driving in the car home from a family gathering and she's over there kind of with the Kleenex and you're like, what, what, what? Not only does she have to bear being more sensitive, she has to bear the injustice of explaining it to you. <laughs> Listen, God made women with a capacity to feel for others more quickly and with more compassion than men. They feel things through words and actions that guys hardly even notice. Women are more sensitive than men. Secondly, Women are more security-oriented than men. God made us to protect and provide. 
And ladies need to know that that's going to happen. All right? It might seem like a great idea to you to take everything that you've spent the last few years building and, and kind of risk it all for some great adventure. She's probably up for an adventure, but she needs to know that it's going to be fine and you're going to be safe. Your job is to protect and provide her, all right? She's not just the caboose on your train, yo. She's a partner, okay? And so you can't put everything at risk and not put at risk your marriage. Women are more sensitive, more security-oriented. Women are prone to emotional extremes and needs. Like, that ain't true. My husband crazy compared to me. Well, check this. 75% of depression medication is prescribed for women. Why? Because women often carry the burden of all that is disintegrating around us while men uh, dig deep in the couch to try to find the remote. Okay? Women bear the weight of what's really happening because they're more sensitive emotionally. They see how your actions are affecting your son. They see how your actions are affecting your future. They carry the weight of what your marriage could be versus what it is. Thank God for that. They're the warning system in your marriage. And because they sense and feel things that men don't always sense and feel, that's why women are more, and, and they know they have a problem, so they go and try to get some help for it. As men kind of blindly amble forward like a grizzly that just awoke from his hibernation, wondering why there's a problem as they scratch themselves. <laughs> men, be a student of your wife. Accept her, enjoy her. Delight in her difference. Understand her. Study her. All of that under that first important phrase. I challenge you to memorize it and keep it at the forefront of your thinking. You'll account to Christ for it someday. Husbands, love your wives. And then this great phrase, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wow. So, the greatest act of selflessness that has ever been displayed in the history of humanity is God himself, the second person of the Trinity, becoming a man, <laughs> living a perfect life, and taking upon himself the punishment for your sin and mine. That's the gospel. Your sin upon Christ. Your sin upon Christ. He took upon himself the penalty for your sin. God's wrath was poured out on him for what you did, for what I did. That's the most awesome demonstration of selfless love that's ever been given. Amen. And God gives the summa cum laude of sacrificial love as the model for how you're supposed to love your wife. You're like, well, what's it supposed to look like? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Do it like that, bro. Do it like that. You're like, yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm even getting a C on my report card in that category. The most important human relationship, husband and wife, is held up to the greatest relational act that has ever been expressed. Do it like that. 100% no thought for himself but only for us as he gave his life and died as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Question, how can I love my wife as Christ loved the church? Obviously, first of all, as just expressed, by giving yourself for her. Give yourself for her. Spend your best energy for her. Spend your best time for her. Spend your uh, greatest priorities for her. The mutual you before me works well. Oh, yeah, by the way, that works well in dating relationships. Like, uh, anybody here dating? Put up your hand if you're dating. Dating? You're dating? All right, so you're dating, and, and you go out with your boyfriend, right? And like every, every date, it's got to be like, 
I did some stuff for him, he did some stuff for me. How'd that go? Good, good. Want to do it again? Yeah, let's. <laughs> That's dating, right? How many people remember that stage? And you got to settle the account every three hours. Is it working? Is it working? Is it working? All right. Uh, everyone say marriage is not like that. Marriage actually has days or weeks or months where one person is giving far more than what the other person is giving. We don't settle the, that account every week or every month, but don't let that season become a lifetime. That needs to reverse itself when it can. My parents were married <coughs> 54 years. Their last season was the toughest. My dad laid down his life for my mom for two years. Slept in the room right next to her, up many times in the night, learned how to give her all of her medications. She couldn't even talk for the last 18 months, but he held her hand and stroked her hair and loved her and loved her and loved her till the end. When she couldn't give anything back at all, all she was was draining the life out of him. But he found in the Lord the grace and capacity to spend himself out of love for her. What a model. What an example of what a lifetime of love is supposed to be about. And he didn't rally to that in the last 10 minutes, let me tell you. That, that kind of love was built over a lifetime. Okay? And that's what we as men are all aspiring to. The kind of love that can give and give and give for a season as it's needed. How can I love my wife as Christ loved the church? By giving yourself for her. Secondly, by leading her towards spiritual maturity. Notice in verse 26. <coughs> Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her. Sanctification is what happens after conversion. It's the transforming power of the gospel in my life. The word means to be set apart, to be changed. All right? Your wife desperately needs you to be changing, and your changing selfless capacity is what God is using to sanctify her. It's not just the man who is changed by the selfless love of the woman, the woman is changed by the sanctifying, selfless love of the man. Some of you are listening to this message and saying, I would be 100% as a man willing to do my part, but I have serious questions about whether a day or a week or a month or even a year of that would produce any change in her cantankerous nature. You're just wrong about that. And how, how many days and weeks of success do you have to point to as proof that you're right? I have the Word of God and the testimony of thousands of people in this church and the testimony of church history itself that your selfless love will sanctify your wife. You will get to a place where you don't even recognize the woman that she has become and your love is the tool that God will use to get her there. And it's your responsibility how can I love my wife as Christ loved the church? By giving yourself for her, by leading her towards spiritual maturity. Here are some things that will help. Three things. One, model a walk with God. Your wife knows whether you're in the Word, man. She knows. She knows whether you're praying. You could be leading a small group but not walking with God yourself, and she knows it. Your wife needs to see you modeling up in the morning, late up at night, Bible open. Sincerely, she needs to occasionally see you bowing your head in prayer, calling out to God for your family. Model a walk with God. That's the first thing. Second thing, leading her towards spiritual maturity. Encourage your wife by praying for her. I don't know of a single thing that lights the fire of intimacy in a marriage like a man praying for his wife. I challenge some of you men in humility, get on your knees before your wife today 
kneel down in front of her, put your hands on her knees, bow your head, and call out to God for her. Pray for her heart, pray for her health, pray for her life, pray for her relationships. Call out to God for the things that you know burden her heart. Pour out your heart to God for her. You're responsible for her spiritually. Take that role of leadership. Seize it for yourself. Model a walk with God. Encourage your wife by praying for her. This was very convicting to me. I hadn't done this recently, and I will do it today. Influence your wife by inquiring about her walk spiritually. As I prepared this message, I wrote that down. I thought to myself, I talked to one of our pastors walking off stage. We agreed, I haven't done that recently. Ask your wife how she's doing with the Lord. Ask her how her faith is. Ask her what she's struggling with. Ask her how you can pray for her about that. Inquire. Pastors are responsible for a whole church. Husbands are responsible for their own family and most of all their marriage. How many of us are burdened for the spiritual lives of our children but haven't inquired about the spiritual life of our wife? Ask her how she's doing. Talk to her about it. How can I love my wife as Christ loved the church? By giving yourself for her, by leading her towards spiritual maturity. Verse 27 continues that thought, so that he might present the church to himself. That's why Christ did this. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be a holy and without blemish. You understand this is a picture, right? So let me insert the application. Why would a husband give himself for his wife? that he might sanctify his wife, verse 26, having cleansed his wife by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present his wife to himself in splendor, so that he might present his wife without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be whole, that his wife might be holy and without blemish, verse 28. In the same way husbands should love their wives, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Jot this down by protecting her. By protecting her. You have to protect your wife in every way. Protect her. That's your responsibility. Genesis 2.24 says that a Man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Most people understand that marriage is oneness, right? Did you understand that before he came today? You guys are one, right? Right? The problem in marriage is which one, right? I think we're me. No, I think we're me. No, we're us. That's what we are. We're us, each giving for the other. And men, you're to protect your wife. You're to protect her physically. That means you're supposed to be sensitive and careful about things that scare her. You're not supposed to be irritated when she tells you to slow down in the car. (laughs) All right? I got convicted lately. My wife got in the car, and she reclined the seat. I said, why are you doing that? She said, I don't want to see. (laughs) Right? Everyone point to whose responsibility that is. Right? Protect her physically. Protect her emotionally, things that upset her, things that cause her to feel afraid, even when it's you. Protect her physically, protect her uh, emotionally, protect her spiritually, okay? What is your wife reading? What is she watching? What is she learning about? Do you care? Ask her. What are you watching? What is that you're reading? Take care of her, protect her. And then nourish her. Notice in the text. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Okay? Nourishes and cherishes. Those are great words. The nourishing here obviously is not talking about watching her diet. Women are usually pretty good at watching their own diets. What it's saying is what food does for her body, you must seek to do for her emotions. You must nourish her. When you put a drop of water on a dry sponge, you notice how quickly it disappears. 
The same is with a word of kindness for an emotionally parched woman. They soak it up like a sponge. Listen, I ache for the women in our church who live in emotional deserts. I ache for the women in our church who live in emotional deserts where little is said, nothing is noticed, everything is overlooked, every effort, every kindness. Nourish her, and then notice, cherish her. Verse 29, nourishing and cherishing her. You say, what's the model for that? Your own body is the model. The point is, is that I would always defend and protect and take care of and nourish and cherish my own body, and my wife is my own body. I need to think about it like that. Anything that wounds her, anything that hurts her, anything that upsets her, and not just protection from the negative, but insertion of the good to nourish and cherish and bless her as I would my own body. I'm not what I used to be, and she probably isn't either, and it is great hypocrisy to cast about for some other point of validation Bring a mirror with you next time you're thinking that way. Your wife is perfectly suited for you at every age. She is enduring what you're enduring, the indignity of a body that is decaying on the outside. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And your love needs to grow for her as the years pass by. And she should be more beautiful in your eyes than she's ever been before. And tell her so and make it so. Protect her and nourish her and cherish her. And lastly, I can love my wife as Christ loves the church by putting God before her. Putting God first will always put your wife further because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's stand together for prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for this privilege to communicate your word to your people. Thank you for every marriage in our church, the ones that are doing well and the ones that are struggling today. And for all the ones that are in between that have seen better days and worse days, but they're going along, use these two messages to draw my married sisters to a place of renewed commitment to get behind that man, to support him, to encourage him, to bless him out of reverence for Christ, whether he deserves it or not, whether I feel that I have it in myself or not, but because I love Christ, I'm going to show that by the way that I love and serve and support and care for that man. And Father, even more so, I pray for the men of this church. Give them eyes to see the woman that they are spending their life with. Give them fresh stirrings of compassion for all that she has carried to be his husband this long. Cause him to see it as a great act of sacrificial love, for he knows himself, and he knows the challenges of living with and loving him. Give him great humility. Give him a desire to lead uh, his wife, even as he leaves this room today. Give him words to speak to her, to communicate that he has heard this and that he wants to work on it and that the words have not fallen on a hard heart, but on a heart that is tender and open to her and to her needs. Raise up the marriages in our church as the greatest testimony to the power of the gospel. Let the men in this church love their wives as is seldom seen in this world, patiently and faithfully and sacrificially, and by your Spirit convict all of us of our failure to do that until we in submission to you return again to this first and highest calling. Let us never feel successful apart from the success of our marriage. 
And let us feel that we have your blessing when all else is wrong, provided this is getting the attention it deserves. Call us back to that. Be with the one today who wants to be married or in your grace wants to be married again. Give them patience to wait and cause them to determine in their hearts that only this love will be the object of their pursuit now and forever. All of these things I pray and we pray in the strong name of your great Son, Jesus. Amen.